In the suburbs of Phnom Penh lies an ordinary building with a terrifying secret. Seen from the outside, the Tyol Seng School doesn't look like much. Four small blocks arranged around a leafy courtyard. But this appearance belies a backstory so dark it's almost beyond comprehension. Converted into a prison by Pol Pot's Khmer Rouge during Cambodia's Year Zero, Tiol Slang, now renamed S21, was intended to hold enemies of the regime. Instead, it wound up becoming one of the deadliest prisons in history. Of the 15,000 to 20,000 people to pass through its doors, only 12 survived. The rest became victims of Cambodia's killing fields, one of the worst atrocities of the 20th century. But how did this happen? How did a quiet school in a small Asian country become ground zero for a genocide? Well, today we're going to delve into the history of both S21 and the bloodthirsty regime that made it possible. And just before we get into it today, there's going to be some pronunciation in here that I'm definitely going to get wrong. I'm looking it up when I can. If I don't get it right, it is what it is. I am doing my best. It was January the 8th, 1979, when Ho Van Tay's life changed forever. The day before, the Vietnamese army had marched on the Cambodian capital to find it almost utterly deserted. A combat photographer, Ho had been one of the first civilians to witness the eerie silence of Phnom Penh, its streets still filled with rusted cars abandoned four years earlier. Now, as he crept through the dead city that cool January day, Ho could have no idea that he was about to achieve another terrifying first. Out in the suburbs of Phnom Penh, the photographer noticed an unpleasant smell. Along with a colleague, he followed the stench to a quiet, leafy school. From the outside, the building looked peaceful, an empty school in an empty city. But then Ho looked closer and saw the wire netting lining the open-air corridors, the Khmer Rouge slogan painted above the entrance. It was at this point that Ho entered his long nightmare. Inside the school, the bodies of men lay chains to metal bed frames, their throats slit, and their skin already infested with maggots. Upstairs, whole classrooms had been subdivided into makeshift cells, barely large enough to hold an adult. Outside their walls hung whips and chains and other instruments of torture. The Vietnamese photographer couldn't have known it that day, but he had just stumbled across the site of the worst atrocity since the Holocaust. The name of this death camp? S21, the heart of the Cambodian genocide. The school complex that would become S21 had first been constructed 17 years earlier in 1962. Originally named after the legendary Cambodian king Ponhea Yat, it was built at a time when royalty was all the rage. Back then, the country was ruled by Prince Sihanouk, at this stage still a hero to his people. Crowned king before the outbreak of World War II, Sihanouk had steered his country through a Japanese occupation, then used diplomatic pressure to win independence from France in the post-war years. Since then, he'd carefully plotted Cambodia on a course of non-alignment, skillfully balancing his nation between the capitalist and communist blocs. As neighboring countries like Vietnam were literally split in two by the pressures of the Cold War, this came to be seen as a great achievement. But don't go thinking Sihanouk was some benign figurehead. The prince was a dude who craved power. In 1955, Sihanouk had abdicated in favor of his father and founded a political movement, Sangam Reister Nium. He then used a mixture of his genuine popularity and a heavy dose of voter suppression to win every seat in the National Assembly. When his father died five years later, Sihanouk refused to replace him, leaving himself as both Cambodia's prime minister and its head of state. So, yes, while Sihanouk may have been beloved in the early 60s, he was also clearly someone who'd sell his own mother to a Dutch brothel in return for power. But although Sihanouk was broadly popular, not all of his subjects were on board with his reign. In Phnom Penh, a disaffected teacher at a private school, had clocked Sihanouk's growing authoritarianism and decided to stop him. That teacher's name was Saloth Sa, but you probably know him by his alias, Pol Pot. In no time at all, the coming clash between Pol Pot and Sihanouk would bring Cambodia to its knees. One of the great ironies of communism is that so many of its leaders came from the same privileged backgrounds that they rallied against. 
Pol Pot's family had been relatively prosperous landowners, allowing the boy to travel to France for his education. There, Pol Pot had fallen in with the French Communist Party and returned to Cambodia, determined to ignite a peasant revolution. Unfortunately, Cambodia's peasants were all pretty much like, nah, we're cool, bro, and Pol Pot had instead taken a job teaching French at a private school in the capital. Even when he founded the local Communist Party in 1960, it just attracted a handful of members. In a saner world, that would have been Pol Pot's biography, a middle class teacher of secretly daydreaming of revolution. But sadly, this wasn't a sane world. It was a world drenched in Cold War paranoia. And that paranoia was about to turn this wannabe revolutionary into the real deal. In 1963, Prince Sihanouk became concerned about communism in Cambodia. Although the movement was basically just Pol Pot and his mates farting around Phnom Penh, crackdown was ordered and the communists fled into the jungle. There, in the forests on the Vietnamese border, they began their slow transformation into real revolutionaries. Over the next two years, Pol Pot formed his political philosophy. He came to respect the local hill tribes who had no use for money or Buddhism and were completely self-sufficient. Such self-sufficiency would become a pillar of Cambodian communism and the reason that it was so destructive. Come 1965, Pol Pot was ready to act. That year, the US escalated its war in North Vietnam. Frightened, the Viet Cong would respond by entering Cambodia. Prince Sihanouk signed a secret agreement letting Hanoi build bases on his side of the border. Sadly for Sihanouk, the agreement didn't stay secret for very long. In Cambodia, Vietnam had classically been seen as the enemy, sort of like how Poland feels about Russia. So when word got out that the prince was collaborating with the bad guys, people were pissed. In 1967, a revolt exploded in Bat Dam Bang province, manipulated by Pol Pot's Khmer Rouge. Terrified of being overthrown, Sihanouk responded by going full authoritarian. His police began abducting people off the streets, torturing them and murdering them. Prominent dissidents were assassinated, and entire villages were burned to the ground. It was meant to cow the population. Instead, it became Pol Pot's greatest recruiting tool. Over the next three years, clashes between Sihanouk's army and the Khmer Rouge increased as the communists gained ground. But then 1970 rolled around and brought a deeply ironic twist. That March, Prince Sihanouk visited the USSR to try and drum up support for his regime, having already made overtures to China. While he was away, General Lon Nol deposed him in a coup, establishing a pro-West military dictatorship. So Sihanouk decided to retake his throne in the maddest way possible. Turning to Beijing, Sihanouk was all like, hey, you know that Pol Pot guy you're financing to overthrow me and establish a communist state? Turns out, I'm super into the idea. Where do I sign up? And just like that, Prince Sihanouk was no longer fighting the Khmer Rouge, but he was fighting with them. He even went on radio telling his subjects to join Pol Pot's army and overthrow General Lon Nol. This was the start of the Cambodian Civil War. When it finally ended, it would usher in an era of unparalleled bloodshed. At this point in the narrative, most videos skip ahead to 1975, when Pol Pot's army finally took Phnom Penh. But while this does propel the story forward, it fails to explain how. How did the Khmer Rouge go from being obscure jungle communists to ruling a country? The answer there is a deadly combination of greed and incompetence. We've already seen Prince Sihanouk's greed push him to make a devil's pact with the Khmer Rouge. And now it's time for General Lon Nol to add the incompetence. In this case, by vowing to destroy Sihanouk's secret Viet Cong bases. The result was a North Vietnamese invasion of Cambodia. Suddenly, the military dictatorship was no longer just fighting Pol Pot and Prince Sihanouk, but the communist Vietnamese army. Then South Vietnam and its American allies also invaded, and everything went to hell. In five bloody years, the Cambodians of war killed around 300,000 people. At its height, the Viet Cong were handing huge swaths of territory to the Khmer Rouge, while US bombers were dropping more munitions onto the countryside than were dropped onto Japan during the whole of World War. War II. Although both North Vietnam and the US pulled back when they realized their actions were only adding to the carnage, by then it was too late. Come 1975, the half decade of constant brutality had driven nearly all the population either into the arms of the Khmer Rouge or into Phnom Penh's refugee camps. As Lon Nol's regime crumbled around him, communist troops surrounded the capital for a final assault. On April 17, 1975, the apocalypse arrived. That day, Khmer Rouge troops, mostly armed teenagers, entered the capital to cheers. After five brutal years, people just wanted an end to the war. It didn't matter who won. 
things just couldn't get any worse than they already were. But oh boy, if there's one thing we've learned producing hundreds of history videos, it's that things can always get worse. The same day they took Phnom Penh, the Khmer Rouge set the wheels of genocide in motion. That afternoon, troops fanned out across the capital, armed with bullhorns. Outside every home, every school, every hospital, they issued their orders. Evacuate immediately, abandon your possessions, and leave the city now. Anyone who refused to listen was shot, as were the slow, the elderly, and anyone too sick or disabled to walk. By evening, the entire capital, over two million people, was on the move. It was perhaps the largest death march in history. Tens of thousands were murdered on April the 17th alone, not just the stragglers, but also intellectuals, the religious, and anyone who showed any emotion. It was the beginning of Cambodia's Year Zero. Before the month was out, hundreds of thousands of executions would take place. Entire Buddhist communities would be slaughtered. The extended families of the rich would be exterminated. The survivors would find themselves separated from their loved ones and sent to toil in the countryside on starvation rations. Inside Phnom Penh itself, the population dropped to a mere 50,000 all Khmer Rouge loyalists. At some point, these loyalists stumbled across the abandoned Ponhir Yat High School, renamed Tiol Slang following General Long Nol's coup. The site must have made an impression, because shortly after, the Khmer Rouge converted it into a prison. Known as S21, it would soon become one of the deadliest prisons on Earth. The Khmer Rouge's attitude to human life can be neatly summed up by one of their slogans. To spare you is no profit, to destroy you is no loss. In S21, that slogan would reach its perverse height. The name S21 first appears on Khmer Rouge documents in September 1975, some five months after the fall of Phnom Penh. However, it wasn't until the end of the year that its site was chosen. That winter, Tiol Slang School was converted into a prison, barbed wire topping its walls, its classrooms hastily partitioned into tiny cells, wire netting placed along the outfacing corridors to deter suicides. A workforce of 1,725 were brought in, ranging from guards and interrogators to on-site chefs and a barrage of record keepers, each of whom was forbidden contact with the outside world. But the most important appointment was that of Kang Q Lu, better known as Brother Duck. A former school teacher, Duck was the camp commander, and a guy so sadistic it'd make Amon Goth from Schindler's List look like a sane and reasonable guy. S21 began operation in May 1976. Officially, it was a place for relocation, but this was just a euphemism. S21's real function was to kill anyone who set foot there. We mean anyone. Some of the things people were imprisoned for were unbelievable. There was an inmate from a work camp who neglected to water the plants, or the Khmer Rouge soldier who was accused of planning to fall asleep while on duty. There was even a former S21 guard whose crime was, we could you not, beating a prisoner to death without permission. But then, that was the Khmer Rouge. One of their slogans went, it is better to arrest 10 people by mistake than to let one guilty person go free. Those arrested included their own members. 500 high-ranking Khmer Rouge were tortured to death inside S21, victims of Pol Pot's paranoia. Tempting as it is to see this as evidence of karma, no one deserved what happened in S21. Prisoners would arrive at the school blindfolded in groups. They would then be photographed and taken to the guards for their first interrogation. Speaking of the guards, all of S21's guards and interrogators were teenagers from peasant backgrounds, often as young as 15. That meant they had no problems being as violent as possible. The first interrogation was often benign compared to what came later. Prisoners were forced to strip naked and give their entire life story from birth until their moment of arrest. This done, they were either taken to a tiny cell and chained to the floor, or taken to a larger room and shackled to a group of other prisoners. Wherever they ended up, it was a nightmare. Any action a prisoner undertook required permission. This included sitting up, using the toilet, or just shifting their weight a little. Anyone who failed to get permission would be beaten, and anyone who cried out while being beaten would be beaten some more. The cells were filled with mosquitoes, and severe overcrowding meant disease was rife. But while there was an average population of 1,500 prisoners on site at any time, you rarely saw the same faces. The life expectancy of S21's inmates was anywhere from a few weeks to only a few days. When those few weeks were finally up, well, we're about to find out. If there's a single vaguely positive thing you can say about Brother Duck, it's that he kept excellent records. 
As a result, we have an extremely good idea of what daily life looked like in S21. At 4.30 a.m. sharp, prisoners were woken up and made to strip for inspection. That done, they were led from their cells and the daily rounds of interrogation would begin. Now, interrogation is a misleading word. It makes it sound like the guards were looking for evidence of guilt. But under the Khmer Rouge, simply being a prisoner was proof of being guilty. In fact, the Cambodian term for prisoner, Nyek Thos, translates as guilty person. Yet it wasn't enough for the guards to just kill you. They needed you to confess to a crime first. And these confessions were extracted in the most horrific ways. Prisoners were subjected to mock drownings, to electric shocks, to having their hands tied behind their backs and being suspended from the ceiling until their limbs broke. People were beaten with clubs and whipped with cables. Salt water was poured into open wounds. The craziest part is that the guards didn't know what they were looking for. The prisoners would confess to the wildest things to stop the pain, only for Brother Duch to read the report, declare it phony, and authorize yet more torture to get a real confession. When Duch finally had the arbitrary confession he wanted, he'd send his report to Central Committee, who'd compile that day's must-smash list. Smashing someone was Kaima Rouge speak for killing them. Their list compiled, the committee would send it back to Duch, who'd sign off on it. What happened next depended entirely on who you were. Former Khmer Rouge officials who wound up on Brother Duch's list would be killed then and there in S21, their bodies buried in the courtyard. Any Westerners and a handful of Brits, Americans, Australians, and Canadians did pass through the prison, were killed, and their bodies were burnt to prevent identification. Any Vietnamese, meanwhile, were made to dress up in Viet Cong uniforms, photographed as spies, and then murdered. But for the vast majority of prisoners, a place on the must-smash list meant a seat in one of the trucks that arrived at around 9pm. Each night, anywhere between several dozen and 300 prisoners were loaded onto these trucks and driven 14 kilometers outside of Phnom Penh to a place called Chong Ek. The prisoners were told they were being transferred, but if you had known Chong Ek's other name, you'd know that this was a cruel lie. Chong Yek is better known as the biggest of the killing fields. After the trucks arrived, the prisoners would be herded into a small building where their names were checked against another copy of the day's list. Once everyone had been accounted for, they were taken out in small groups to pre-dug pits. There, they would be told to kneel and their hands tied behind their backs. Finally, a guard would kill them with one or two blows to the back of the neck, usually with an iron axle. In the Khmer Rouge's twisted worldview, bullets were too expensive to waste killing dissidents. The blow delivered, the victims were buried in the pit, rare survivors suffocated. And yet, this awful fate wasn't the worst way to die at S21. The records show that several prisoners were harvested for their blood, their bodies drained dry so transfusions could be given to Khmer Rouge soldiers. At least one teenage girl was even used as a medical experiment, cut open alive without anesthetic to help train the regime's surgeons. In short, S21 was hell on earth, a place so brutal that it could rival Nazi Germany. Luckily, the regime behind it, though, they were on the edge of collapse. While the Khmer Rouge had been busy establishing their communist utopia of forced labor and genocide, across the border, a different kind of communist government had emerged. Just days after the fall of Phnom Penh, North Vietnamese forces had captured Saigon, ending the Vietnam War. But while both Cambodia and unified Vietnam were now communist, they were far from comrades. Remember how he said that Cambodians viewed Vietnamese as their historical enemies? Well, turns out the Khmer Rouge were no different. Despite the Viet Cong helping them win the civil war, the Khmer Rouge were terrified Hanoi had plans to absorb their nation into a Vietnamese superstate. So they elected to kill as many Vietnamese as possible. As the 1970s rolled on, the Khmer Rouge began a series of attacks on Vietnam that soon escalated into massacres. The worst came in 1978, when some 3,157 Vietnamese civilians were murdered by Cambodian death squads. At first, Hanoi tried to negotiate. They were both communist, after all, surely they could come to some sort of agreement. But the Khmer Rouge just kept on attacking, until Hanoi declared, well, to hell with this. On December 25, 1978, the full might of the Vietnamese army came crashing across the border. Although still backed by China, the Khmer Rouge simply weren't capable of fighting back. Their army collapsed. By January the 6th, the Vietnamese were closing in on Phnom Penh. When Brother Duch got the news, he calmly ordered all remaining prisoners at S21 be massacred. Then he fled the city, possibly the last Khmer Rouge official to leave the capital. The next day, the Vietnamese army took Phnom Penh. One day after that, a photojournalist named Ho Van Tae followed a sickly smell through the dead city suburbs and stumbled across the horror show that was S21. By now, up to 20,000 had been murdered there. Across the whole of Cambodia, some 2 million had died, equivalent to a quarter 
of the entire population. Per capita, it was one of the worst atrocities of the 20th century, worse even than the Rwandan genocide or Stalin's gulags. Yet its architects would never face justice. As the Vietnamese rolled in, Pol Pot fled into the jungle. There he remained part of the Khmer Rouge until he was deposed in 1997 and placed under house arrest. He died of natural causes in 1998, unrepentant to the last. Prince Sihanouk II lived out the rest of his days in comfort. Despite being the guy who helped Pol Pot take power, Sihanouk was re-crowned King of Cambodia after the Vietnamese occupation ended, only abdicating his throne in 2004. He died in Beijing in 2012 at the ripe old age of 89, convinced to the last that his poisonous lust for power had no connection to the Khmer Rouge's rise. Thankfully, though, this kind of peaceful ending eluded Brother Duch. After going into hiding, the sadistic camp commander converted to Christianity and became a preacher. When he was arrested at the end of the 90s, he declared that his religion made him repentant and he would confess to all his crimes. In 2007, he stood before Cambodia's genocide court, the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia, and entered a guilty plea. He was convicted in 2010 of crimes against humanity and sentenced to life in prison. But what of S21 itself? One year after the Vietnamese victory, the prison's trove of documents were put on display and it was reopened as a museum. It still stands in Phnom Penh today, almost untouched since the day that Ho Van Thê stepped across its threshold and into a nightmare. Thanks to Brother Duke's confessions, we now have a close to complete understanding of the horrors that went on inside its walls. It was here, in this former school, that the worst crime since the Holocaust was perpetrated, that one of the worst genocides in recorded history took place. Even Auschwitz, although it killed far more people overall, had a higher survival rate at around 10 to 15 percent, compared to a mere 0.06 percent for S21. Given such awful numbers, it's tempting to think of S21 as a one-off, a freak of history only made possible by one sadistic man. But that would be to take the wrong lesson away from this story. Across the world, even now, genocides are underway that could be as bad as Cambodia's. In Syria and in Iraq, the last remnants of ISIS continue to murder Yazidis. In Central African Republic, Christian and Muslim militias slaughter their neighbors. In North Korea's gulags, untold numbers die in silence. And that's just the tip of the iceberg, a slice of the many atrocities humans commit against one another daily. The tale of S21 then isn't something confined to history, a story that we can easily dismiss. It's a warning. A warning about what happens when you divide a population, when leaders care only about power, when we see our enemies not as people, but as slogans. Sure, we can pretend that S21 could only ever happen in Cambodia or only under communism. It's comforting to think of it that way. It's simple. But the truth is, the places like S21 will always be with us. Only when we accept that they could happen anywhere else, will we have the faintest chance of stopping them.